So, firstly, thank you um, to IIED for organising the event, um, and to my co-hosts as well, obviously. Um, I'm going to talk for about half an hour. If I can talk non-stop for half an hour, I might sort of <laughs> have a pause in the middle. Um, what I'm going to do first is just outline what is going to be in this talk so that you've got a bit of structure and you know where I'm going with it and broadly the points that I'm trying to make. Um, at its very, very broadest level, this is a talk about the relationship between climate change, drought, migration and armed conflict, specifically in Syria. So that is, that is the overarching theme of, of this talk. Um, but what I really want to do is, is look at two things. Firstly, exactly what is that relationship? What is the relationship between those, those things I listed? Climate, migration, drought, <clears throat> and armed conflict. But secondly, to, to ask, how did the media cover this? What did the media say about these things? And crucially, was the way the media presented it correct? Or perhaps more accurately, how much of it was correct and how much of it was speculation and how much of it was wrong? So those are the two questions of analysis that, that I want to try and cover. The first one is actually about the reality of what happened and the second one is about what the media said about it. But I'm actually going to ask those two questions in, in the other order. I'm going to start by outlining what the media said. Um, and I think this is an interesting way of doing it because what it allows us to do is to start with some familiar points. Lots of you in this room probably read various pieces of media coverage that were looking at climate change and the conflict in Syria. It was a big news topic. It was a big story last year. So I want to begin with the media and begin the talk by outlining what it, what it is that they, that they said. There's also some useful stopping off points during this talk as well. It won't just stick exactly to the topics that I outlined. So along the way, um, we can also look more broadly at the relationship between climate change and migration. So stepping back from what's been going on in Syria and looking more generally at the relationship between climate change, migration and displacement. We can also look more generally as we go along at the relationship between climate change and armed conflict. And I separate those two out because I think theoretically they're very, very different um, and it doesn't always make sense to discuss them in the same breath. Along the way, we'll also touch on a few points more generally about the way the media covers climate change and some of the tensions within that. So, yes, it's specifically about climate migration conflict in Syria, but with some wider, looking at some wider issues around climate change, <clears throat> migration and conflict more broadly. So I think the first question that I want, I want to try and answer is this. Why did the media write so much about climate change and conflict in Syria last year? Right? This isn't a topic that has been in the, in the news for the entirety of the conflict in Syria. Um, it's a topic that the media latched onto, I would say, in the spring and summer of last year and then had a second go at in the run-up to the Paris climate change negotiations. So I think there's a very important question that we can, we can ask, which is why then? Why 2015? Why those particular points over the summer? And I think there are two really key things that basically explain, explain that. The first one is the tragedy in the Mediterranean that unfolded in 2015. And that tragedy has continued into 2016 and, in fact, was going on in the years preceding as well. 
But certainly 2015 was the year when the media really started covering the tragedy in the Med. The second key element that created this, this new story was a research paper by a group of researchers led by Colin Kelly, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in America. And although there had already been some research connecting drought and the conflict in Syria and other research connecting climate change and drought and other papers connecting drought and internal migration in Syria, this paper of Colin Kelly's uh, and his team was really the first time that a group of researchers had produced peer-reviewed paper that put all of those elements... Oh, got a wake-up alarm from someone. (laughs) Um, This paper was really the first time that someone had put all of those elements together in one paper and not just put them together, say, in a a blog post or, you know... um, kind of their thoughts on the internet this was peer-reviewed science connecting like making this causal connection making this causal chain right the way from climate change through drought through internal movement to conflict to the wider Syrian refugee crisis and my view at any rate is that those two things the tragedy in the Mediterranean combined with this new kind of all-encompassing research paper um, is what gave the media the, the opportunity to write about this issue and to write about it so extensively at that particular time. So that's, that's the why, if you like. That's why, that's why the media were writing about this issue in 2015, and that's why this issue kind of, although it clearly was already happening, it's why it basically entered the public consciousness um, in, a, in a kind of much wider way when it did. Um, so obviously because of my work I read a lot of those news stories as they came out but what I didn't have as I was reading them really was a systematic analysis of everything that the media was saying about it so one of the first things that we tried to do was to do that analysis Um, to an extent, it was slightly rough and ready. I'm sure if there are scholars in the room whose area is the analysis of the media, they might want to. We might want to talk methodology later. But basically, I use you know I use Google News search to find all the stories that have um, climate change and Syria in the title over a over a certain period of time, um, and we then pulled out about 40 or 50 different stories and tried to read them and draw out really what the common things are in those stories. What can we say uh, about the commonality of those stories? What are they all saying or not saying? What key elements do they all have in them or, more importantly, not have in them? What can we say about the certainty with which they present this relationship? What can we say about the role that refugees and migrants play in the stories that they wrote. Now, the analysis of the news stories was not exhaustive. Um, We focused really on news stories in English and news stories that were associated with really what you might call kind of big-name outlets. So we tended not to scour the kind of wider blogosphere, but really we pulled out stories that were, for example, in the Financial Times, the Times, Guardian, Washington Post, and then further in outlets that aren't necessarily newspapers, but are certainly big media institutions like CNN. So that was kind of how we bounded what we were going to look at. Um, Geographically, most of those institutions were based in northern countries, the UK, the US, New Zealand, Canada, Ireland. So this is an, an analysis, really, of what the northern English-speaking media is saying about this issue. Um, now, clearly, that is likely to be very different from what other uh, categories of the media will be saying. But I think it is nonetheless 
important to examine that because it's likely, and I think what our analysis showed, um, much of the coverage was highly, highly problematic. So that, if you like, is um, what we set out to do <clears throat> and roughly what, how, how we went about it. So what I'm going to do first is outline how the media made this story. Now, of course, there was some diversity in the way the media covered this. Obviously, every news story is not identical. But nonetheless, it was possible to draw out several kind of key points in the, in the media narrative that, when viewed together, essentially form a causal chain, basically a story of how the media think that climate change, migration, and the conflict in Syria are linked. Not every story covered every one of these points, but looking at the coverage as a whole, it, it's possible to kind of draw out these key elements. So what I'm going to do now is basically lay out that media narrative for you. And as I do it, what I want you to bear in mind is that this is not me presenting to you what I think the correct analysis is. This is me presenting what the media said is going on, okay? So I don't want to be <laughs> quoted <laughs> while you're live tweeting. <laughs> Alex says this, okay? This is what Alex says the media says, okay? Yeah, and that's a risk, but... Yeah. So there's the caveat. Um, but what I want you to pay attention for as I do this kind of rundown is the way that refugees and migrants are portrayed in this analysis. So that's kind of the thing to look out for. I'll, I'll kind of offer my view of how they've been portrayed at the end, but I think it, it kind of becomes fairly clear as I, as, I, as I do this rundown. So here is, by and large, what most of the northern English-speaking media said. First... They draw a link between climate change and drought. And I think in many cases that was fair comment. There is a clear link, well-proven link between climate change and drought. They then drew a further connection between drought and rural to urban migration. Now, again, I think that is another piece of fair analysis. There is lots of evidence linking drought with the movement of people from rural areas into cities. So, so far the media are are not doing too badly. But this is the point where I think the media narrative, to an extent, departs from, I don't want to say reality, but um, from the analysis that I'm going to give later. This is the, the point of, of divergence. They then argue that as people move from Syria's rural areas into cities... There, there was an intense strain on the resources in the cities. Now, now, that is very likely true. But the leap that they make next is highly problematic. The leap they make next is that rural Syrian migrants and the existing residents of cities, of the Syrian cities that they'd moved to, then fought each other over those scarce resources. And in most of the media stories that was either made explicitly, you know, that point was made explicitly, it was framed very directly as a resource war, or it was sort of left unsaid. You were, you were left um, to make that assumption. And the, the stories would kind of lead you to that by saying, you know, the cities very rapidly began to run out of food and violence ensued, okay? But one way or another... You were either told or led to believe that essentially Syrians from rural areas and Syrians who were already in cities fought each other over the remaining food, water, fuel, housing and so on. Either stated explicitly in the coverage or again kind of just left for you to, to imagine was the idea that those conflicts then erupted along religious and ethnic lines. So essentially, to the casual reader, the media presented this 
as an episode of climate-driven migration followed by essentially an ethnic or religious resource war. The final part of the media story is then that this violence that had begun in the cities escalates. <clears throat> and with a few kind of elisions and leaps, we go from a resource conflict in the cities to a full-scale war in Syria. That was by and large how the media played it. So what I want to do now is begin to unpack the bits of that narrative that are right and the bits of it that are wrong and look at why bits of it are enormously problematic. But before we do that, there's a sort of final element that was in many of the media stories. And this was a kind of concluding piece of speculation. So, for example, <clears throat> most stories outlined a causal chain similar to the one that I've just told you. And then many of them on the end, or kind of during the article in one place or another, speculated, for example, that although this was, an, although this was happening now, the future inevitably would hold more of this. There would be bigger and more dramatic episodes of climate-driven migration. Or there would be bigger and more catastrophic um, episodes of climate-linked conflict. So, for example, um, on the question of future climate-linked migration, the Washington Post ran a story with the headline <clears throat> Climate Future Will Bring Syria Refugee Crisis Times 100. Um, the New Scientist ran the headline uh, Calais Migrant Camp <clears throat> is a taste of, a warmer, of what a warmer world will bring. Right? So the implication here is not just that the current situation is climate-driven, but that future climate-linked migration will be more chaotic, more dramatic, and on a much larger scale. Uh, there were similar speculative elements when it came to the link between climate change and conflict or even between climate change and terrorism. So in the run-up to the Paris negotiations uh, at the end of last year, Time magazine um, ran a story titled Why Climate Change and Terrorism Are Linked, which was essentially making the case for a strong climate deal coming out of the Paris talks, which I think we can all is agree is essential. But their point was that having this agreement was a key way of fighting terrorism. But implied in that also is the idea that the migrants fleeing Syria were likely to be terrorists. So it very rapidly becomes a deeply, deeply problematic narrative. Similarly, the Toronto Star ran a story to fight terrorism, we must fight climate change. Again, I think you know, we can all agree that the idea, again, that was in the run-up to Paris, the need for robust climate change agreement is essential. But nonetheless, the implication in the story was that climate change would cause migration, and migration somehow, or maybe even migrants, would themselves be uh, a vector for terrorism. So what you came away with was, um, on the one hand, very, very kind of progressive, admirable um, demands for a strong climate change deal out of Paris, but on the flip side of it, um, an element of scaremongering around migration and refugees and an implication that refugees and migrants would be a source of terrorism or, if not terrorism, at least a source of violence and chaos. So, that sort of is a summary of, um, I think, a fair summary of the way the media ran with that, and a summary of some of their elements of speculation at the end. So, 
what I want to do now is basically take that media narrative, start with the media narrative, and kind of unpack which bits of it I think stand up to scrutiny, which bits of it are supported by some evidence, which bits of it are not supported. Essentially, this is a kind of <clears throat> yes, no, maybe exercise on, on, on every element of that, of that media discourse. So, if we begin at the top of that chain of events again. As I said, I think the link between climate change and drought is very well established. I think we don't need to kind of criticise the media for making that connection. Again, the relationship between drought and rural urban migration is well established too. So in that sense, I don't think the media uh, and any of the journalists that wrote those stories need to be criticised for making that connection. I think, I think they were right to. But here's the point of departure. I don't think really that there is any credible evidence for a resource war in Syria's cities. And specifically, I think there is no credible evidence for that resource war in Syria's cities happening along religious or ethnic lines. I think what there is evidence for is an act, broadly an act of cooperation between many of the newly arrived rural migrants and many of the existing urban residents. And that act of cooperation was not simply about their immediate survival, but actually formed the beginning of the uprising in 2011. So the early stages of the uprising were an act of solidarity between the rural migrants who, yes, had moved partly because of the drought, and the urban residents, and the extra numbers, the confidence of those extra numbers, I think you can make a credible case for being uh, a kind of key motive force in the beginning of the uprising. So this was not an act of competition and violence between rural to urban migrants and city residents. This was an act of cooperation and solidarity between those two groups against the Syrian regime. Now that is a key difference because in the media narrative, the migrants are a source of violence and chaos in their own right. They are people who fight with their fellow citizens over scarce resources. But in what I think is the correct version of events, that isn't the case. They're people who join together to overthrow the Syrian regime. And that fundamentally is is a very, very different story, a completely different story. So just to kind of put that, because I, I can't really overstate this bit, this is, this is the kind of crux of the talk, right? It wasn't a resource war. It wasn't a resource war along religious or ethnic lines. Migrants and existing residents cooperated in an attempt to overthrow the regime, and it was the additional numbers that came with that rural-urban migration that made the beginning of the uprising possible. Some scholars have even pointed to what they call the rural nature of the uprising. So I think if you look at most of the commentary on on the beginning of the uprising in Syria, it's portrayed very much as an urban thing. You know, all the footage, all the photographs are of it happening in Syria's cities. Now that that's true. That is that is where it happened. But for most of the rural people who were involved in those uprisings, there is a backstory that goes, <clears throat> and I'll, if anyone's interested in the, in the references to this, we can, we can talk afterwards and I can, I can give you the papers. But preceding the, um, the uprising in 2011, for a long time there had been a system in Syria of... Um, rural farming finance cooperatives, essentially microfinance cooperatives. 
that over the decade preceding the uprising, the Syrian regime had um, gone to great lengths to dismantle for a number of reasons. Partly um, because they were giving ordinary Syrians essentially a taste of democracy. They were running these these microfinance cooperatives. And those began to be taken apart by the regime. At the same time, rural people obviously had lots of other grievances against the regime. And then as the drought struck, <clears throat> their livelihoods were further and further eroded. To the point where this analysis goes, people in rural areas were essentially ready to begin an uprising. So that, combined with the fact that many of them were moving into the cities to try and find alternative work, meant that when they got there, they met an urban population with a set of some similar grievances, other different grievances. When those two groups combined, there was the numbers, enough anger to begin, begin those protests that turned into the uprising. Now... As we know, the uprising clearly was not successful. Um, but neither was the Syrians, Syrian regime's uh, attempts to crush the uprising completely successful either. So what happened was the prolonged nearly six-year conflict that we've seen since. So, what I want to move on to now is, if you like, that was my analysis of the media's narrative. What I want to do now is some analysis of those speculative elements of, of what the media said. So, looking specifically at the media's speculation about future patterns of climate link migration and future patterns of climate link conflict. How am I doing for time, by the way? I don't want to... Yeah, you've got over... another five, ten minutes. Another five, ten minutes. Okay, that's, that's about right. So, the, the media... Um, the way the, me the media portrayed future episodes of climate link migration within those articles about Syria tended to see it in several ways. Firstly, that it would be en masse people would move in large numbers together. Secondly, that it would be refugee-like. In other words, the people who would be moving um, would appear in most ways to be refugees. Um, and thirdly, that it would be from poorer to richer countries. That tended to be the, the picture that was painted. Now, what I'm not about to do here is tell you that there is no link between climate change and migration, obviously, because that is what my organisation does. We are a group of uh, migration and refugee NGOs that are working together on how climate change may reshape the patterns of our work in the future. But that doesn't mean that that portrayal of this issue by the media is necessarily correct. I think it is certainly true that climate change has the power to reshape patterns of migration and displacement. I think there is very strong, very robust evidence for that. And in fact, very strong and robust evidence for that happening at the moment. But it is also the case that the vast majority of that displacement and migration that is happening now and that may well happen in the future, <clears throat> the vast majority of it will be internal. People will not cross an international border. People will move within their own countries. That doesn't mean that there will be no cross-border movement as a result of climate change, but it means that the focus, anyone who is interested in, in looking at this issue, anyone who is interested in, in the welfare of the people who are likely to move, the key focus of that needs to be people who will be forced to move or move voluntarily within their own country. 
<laughs> it's also likely that a huge amount of it won't be en masse. It won't be huge numbers of people all moving together. They won't necessarily look like refugees. Lots of people will move to find work. Lots of people, as their livelihoods are eroded, will move before they reach a point of absolute desperation and poverty to find work somewhere else. So they won't appear to be a refugee. They won't have moved in a refugee-like way. Thirdly, there will probably be a lot of seasonal and circular migration. Initially, at least, these patterns of migration won't be people moving from one place to another and then staying there forever. <clears throat> people are likely to move backwards and forwards with the seasons, and backwards and forwards between, for example, rural and urban areas, moving away from rural areas during times of acute water stress or drought, and then moving back as things alleviate. Finally, it's also possible, and indeed we should be hopeful, that for many people, migration forms a part of how they adapt to climate change. So with the right kind of planning, with the right policies, with the right funding, with the right outlook with various governments, climate-linked migration does not have to be uh, a crisis. It does not have to be a disaster. It is possible that it could form a part of millions of people's adaptive strategy. It could be a way that they adapt to climate change. So I think those elements present quite a different picture to the one that the media gave during 2015 when it was talking about Syria. The final point I want to make is about the relationship between climate change and conflict. Again, the media tended to say there are likely to be further huge climate-driven wars. <clears throat> if you just recall some of the headlines I was, I was pointing to earlier. Now... There is evidence pointing both ways for this. There are many, many studies that find a connection between things like altered rainfall, rainfall patterns, altered patterns of heat, uh, of heat um, and drought uh, that correlate with spikes in armed conflict. However, there are also lots of studies that find no effect at all and even some studies that find altered patterns of rainfall or drought actually creating uh, less armed conflict. So, the question then for many scholars in this field is what happens when we look at all of that evidence together? What happens when we put all of those pieces of research together and analyse them as one? Well, there have in fact been more than one one of that kind of analysis done and they again have reached different conclusions so one meta study took all of the research and said well on balance actually it points to a powerful link between climate change and armed conflict another group of researchers took the same papers did a different analysis and said actually there's no link at all my feeling is that actually trying to reach a universal global answer isn't particularly useful when you look individually at those papers you can see that many of them are highly specific they will for example look at one country over one particular time frame and look at one kind of weather event now that's actually useful so for example the fact that a group of researchers found a strong correlation <clears throat> between altered rainfall and increased conflict in brazil is useful Right? That's useful, important information. But it is not cancelled out by the fact that a different group of researchers found the opposite effect in Tanzania. Right? Different countries with different economies, you know, different histories, like of course, like of course, like those impacts are going to be different. We can't take those two studies and say, well, one finds this and one finds the opposite, so there's nothing to worry about. Right? So on this question of climate change and conflict, I think trying to answer this question kind of universally and once and for all and globally is not useful. But trying to answer it specifically about specific locations and specific kinds of disasters is useful. That pretty much brings me to the end of 
of everything that I, I wanted to cover. Um, as a final concluding point, I think, um, and what I hope the discussion leads us to, is how can we work with the media to try and bring more of this complexity, uh, more of this evidence base um, into the way the media covers these issues? Thanks very much, Alex. Um, um, a quick question from me before we proceed. You, you mentioned this issue about the level of rural grievance mm. over the, you know, the dismantling of the cooperatives and other things. Yeah. So I infer from that that when you say there is a link between drought and migration from the rural areas, that there were multiple drivers. It wasn't only drought bad state policy, various other things as well. I, I think that's certainly yeah. the case, yeah. I think um, to, to say that uh, drought was the only reason that people moved from rural to urban areas would, would not be accurate. I mean, rural, you know, urbanisation is, is a global, massive global trend. Um, so it shouldn't surprise us that that is also happening in Syria. Yeah. Um, but I would say that drought added to it or accelerated it, mm -hmm. um, or at the very least is part of the equation. Um, so it's important, but it is, it's not the only force. Right. Thanks. Um, if it's OK, Megan, I'd like to just see if people want to pick up any of the basics around climate change and conflicts and around the causal chain that you identified. Sure. I think, Megan, you'll probably focus very much on the media yeah. side in your yeah. comments. So, yeah. Can I just ask, uh, just a thank you very much, Ian. It's a factual point. Mm. When the journalists make that first, they take the divergent step, Yeah. did they share any kind of evidence that you then found was false, or was there any kind of, were there quotes from anyone? I mean, what substantiated right. that step? Often it was substantiated by what we might call kind of like non-expert commentators. So, for example, um, John Kerry, on behalf of the US government, frequently kind of just made that link and I think you know to see those comments coming out of uh, the State Department is you know I mean I think for a lot of journalists is like okay well you know we've got some evidence we've got key kind of global player here saying it so it's never it was never unsubstantiated but it wasn't all always or indeed ever substantiated by um, piece of evidence yep I think you can you introduce yourselves, yeah, please? Sure. Sorry, I Catherine forgot. Knox from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Right. Um, it might be a question to explore further later, but if the drivers of migration are never solely about climate change, is there a need for climate change refugee protection? Might we want to explore more later? Just interested in how that kind of protection re regime yeah. exists for people, not the media focus, but. Yeah, I mean, that is a huge, huge issue. Yeah, um, I, I don't know whether now or later is the best yeah, time to... Oh, that I did want to come back to it, though, because I think, you know, yeah. the... Yeah, let's, let's, let's make sure we do. Yeah, right. One at the back and one front. Thanks so much. You and Paolo from UCL, and our research this area of Aiden for Islands and not so much Syria. And so I'd like to query the link between climate change and drought. That droughts do not happen just because of precipitation deaths. And in fact, Syria has had six precipitation deficits in 1915. Also, Assad, both of them, pursued very water intensive for agricultural policies. Population in Syria has almost quintupled between 1916 and 2015. And I haven't seen any data on water use per person. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's basically right. You know, so you could. <clears throat> You can kind of place climate change somewhere on the spectrum, can't you, about uh, you know, the extent to which you think it is an important force in any of this. Um, and I think you know, what you presented there is, is kind of a series of facts that sort of push, push climate change back towards the being less important rather than more important in the evidence. But I think even you, I mean, we've, <laughs> we've, we've both kind of researched this field for, for a long time, but I know that you wouldn't rule climate change out of the equation completely. 
Am I, am I roughly right? Yeah, if I get the drift, it's more a question of how you conceptualise drought, whether yeah. you conceptualise it as a biophysical I mean, event or as a... science says climate change would make this sort of drought twice as much more likely. Right. Mm-hmm. right. But right. I think for Syria, the water demand issue today is far more important than climate change. Right. That yeah, would yeah. be different in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Let's go to the Yeah, Stephen Randowski, University of Bristol. I just, if you don't mind, I just want to connect to what you said at the end about climate change and conflict, and you refer to these meta-analyses mm. coming out one way mm. and then the other way. And I think you're talking about this Yang and Burke paper on the one hand, that's then responded to by the Norwegian brief with a large number of authors. I think we're talking about the same thing. We are, yeah. What you didn't mention, though, is that in a reply to that commentary, uh, actually, uh, Siang and Burke pointed to some fairly serious errors in, in the initial commentary. And I think, I mean, I've looked at this literature in some detail, and if I had to put a bet somewhere, I would say there probably is a link globally in the meta-analysis. There is just too much evidence to suggest that there is a link between climate change and conflict. And the papers that show otherwise just don't stand scrutiny quite as much. Right. So just want to offer that maybe as a yeah. different way of reading the literature. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, if you, want to place, if you want to place your bets that way, then I think that's totally legitimate but the point is that we're at the stage of placing bets right oh, we, yeah. you know <laughs> like, yeah, we're kind of we're kind of gambling on this so i think i mean the, it was a really interesting collection of papers and i think it you know all of those researchers basically now seem to despise each other um, <laughs> from what i can work out um in, the, in those two camps but it is it is i think worth saying how they how they did those studies so the first one, um, Burke and Shang, they took, um, I think it was approaching 80 uh, separate papers and did some kind of statistical analysis and said, OK, on balance, there's a connection. Now, their critics then said, well, OK, hang on a minute. Um, some of these papers that you've got in the mix are papers looking at, for example, conflict in the Nile Delta in 2000 BC, right? Society is very different. We can't necessarily draw those kind of conclusions. So they eliminated everything that wasn't, you know, looking at the last 100 years. And then they then said, well, actually, also, there's some studies that you've missed that we think are relevant that should have been in the sample. And they put them in. And then they have a statistical argument that is beyond my... (laughs) completely beyond me. But they come out with two completely different answers. And you're correct that Burke and Shane then reply with a further set of criticisms of the first paper. Um, What do we draw from that? Yeah, if you want to place a bet that there is a link, you can. But I'm not quite sure what we would do with that information. I think it's useful to be able to say specifically in a particular place when a particular society is exposed to a particular kind of hazard, there is um, the potential for conflict because that is where you make some kind of peace-building intervention, right? If I come to you and say there's a link between climate change and conflict, the global average is going to go up, what do you do with that information? It's scary, it's worrying, but it's not exactly useful in preventing violence. <coughs> Thanks. I'm going to take one last question before we go to Megan. Caroline. Yeah. Um, I'm Caroline from IIED. And in this progressive, admirable, scaremongering <laughs> that, that you've been describing, are we talking just about the media? Or are we, in fact, talking about the international development community? And what do you think we should be saying about that? Right. I, so, yeah, OK. So the question of, is this not just the press, but are there also organisations that are essentially saying the same thing? Um, 
I'd say broadly most of the aid and development NGOs have been quite cautious about how they frame this but that doesn't mean that the media have taken their caution and sort of subtlety in their analysis um, I think probably this is from a while back but one of the one of the kind of key examples is um, it, it wasn't Save the Children it was the um, whoever released Megan. It was Jane. It was where? It was yes, with a report called Human Tide, which actually contains a lot of really good analysis, wasn't kind of really off the mark, but it had an executive summary that perhaps kind of over oversimplified it, and then a press release that oversimplified the executive summary, and then a news story that oversimplified the press release, and a headline that oversimplified the news story, and then eventually you had one billion climate refugees as a, as a you know, headline in various places, which was not what Christian Aid had written in the report. Um, but as an example of how those narratives can be created... Um, out of, you know, kind of out of otherwise good pieces of research. Okay, thanks. We'll come back <coughs> to some of those themes um, at the end, but at this point, I'd like to invite Megan to give the discussants comments. Thank you very much. Um, I think it would have been great if we'd have had Alex's sort of analysis available to us, you know, when uh, all this stuff was coming out last year. <laughs> Um, as journalists. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, um, give a few ideas about why um, the media reported on the links between climate change and migration and Syria conflict in the way they did last year. I don't want to defend, I'm not trying to defend media coverage, but I think that obviously, like you say, it, some of it a lot of it was problematic. Um, but just to explain why some of those things may have happened from our perspective, um, from a journalistic perspective, I mean, we were talking about 2015 when the paper came out and then, um, you know, the, the resurgence in September, which, you know, is, from a journalist perspective, is quite a long time after <laughs> some of the events that you were talking about. Um, and so their ability, the journalist's ability to kind of go back and cross-check uh, what happened, you know, with reality on the ground, is almost as if that opportunity had kind of disappeared by then because, you know, I, I, I haven't worked on the ground in Syria, um, you know, but our journalists, Reuters journalists, for example, are they going to go to people now in Aleppo and uh, refugee camps in Turkey or Jordan and start quizzing them about drought and climate change and how that, you know, it's not the first thing that they would probably ask them about. I went back and looked at the, the Kelly paper um, because you made a point in your long form, uh, your long read piece um, about how the researchers didn't really explore, actually, in their own work that connection between, you know, the rural urban migration and the breaking out of the conflict. And they cited some of the, the academic evidence, but briefly. And in the Kelly paper, there's one quote uh, from a woman, I think who was, uh, I think it was a woman, uh, who had migrated, who said, yes, of course, this drought was a, a factor in the out breaking out of the conflict, but that, that was it, that was it. I mean, you know, in terms of actual sort of evidence, I thought, well, you know, I'm not even sure if the media always go back and read a source academic paper. They sometimes don't, I would say. Sometimes they do. And if they had done that, they might have picked up on that one quote, which was used in the paper, and that might have been... Uh, but it didn't really... It didn't explain the, the sort of, you know, the solidarity angle uh, that, you, that you mentioned. Um, and, you know, so I think that... That doesn't help, uh, obviously, because the, the paper was very focused on the climate change drought link rather than, the t you know, making it at least two, time, two to three times more likely than the actual evolution of the political events afterwards. So, you know, even had the journalists gone back there, they would have had to have talked to quite a few more people to tease that out. 
and maybe they wouldn't have had time or, you know, their editor would have been like, right, I need this story in two hours, blah. You know, and you just go with what you've got. So then moving on to the September sort of, you know, slew of stories, um, I pick up on what you said about uh, in response to the question about John Kerry. So in the space of about one week or two weeks, I, I haven't got the exact dates here, we had the president of the European Commission saying in his European Union address in Strasbourg, tomorrow morning we will have climate refugees. Then we have Francois Hollande saying, I can't remember which event it was, it won't be hundreds of thousands of refugees in the next 20 years, it will be millions. And he was talking about if we don't get a deal in Paris. And then before that, the week before that or so, we'd had John Kerry saying, you think migration's a challenge to Europe today because of extremism? Wait until you see what happens when there's an absence of water, an absence of food, or one tribe fighting against another for mere survival. And then there is absolutely no question that the media will, will report on what these people say. These are not people in the street. These are like top-level international politicians. And, you know, we, our job is to report what these people say. Now, I did, when looking at some of the pieces um, around these kind of comments, think that actually the journalists had made a bit of an effort to say, well, you know, it's, it's not that simple and... You know, climate change isn't the only thing that's contributing to conflicts and you know there, there was some querying but these, these, are, these are people who if this isn't true they should know better than to say these things and one of the things that I found quite interesting <clears throat> having followed um, you know the run up to Paris and then I, I was at Paris was how very little migration actually featured um, as an issue at the Paris climate change talks and I think, you know, it's, there's some kind of sort of duplicity going on here because on the one hand, politicians are quite happy to pick out the climate change migration narrative when, you know, they need to, de they need to uh, you know, deflect, say, from the political causes of the, of the refugee crisis in Europe and what they're going to do about it. Um, uh, or when they want to get a climate change agreement. They're quite happy to dust these things off and, like, throw them out there in speeches and then the media will pick up on them. But then when it came to actually doing something about uh, climate-linked migration displacement in Paris, almost nothing. In fact, I don't think Guterres, the head of UNHCR, even came. And, you know, there was a distinct lack of will, political will, to actually deal with this as an issue. Um, and so, you know, then that, that's not a consistent way of dealing with the problem. And I think this, this contributes to the media confusion around around these issues, you know, because it, it's used as a political climate migration or climate link displacement or climate refugees is used as a political tool uh, and then the media kind of gets sucked into that, I think, to a certain extent. From our own perspective, I, I went back and I looked at, you know, how had we dealt with this in 2015. I, I'm a journalist for the um, Thomson Reuters Foundation. We are um, a sort of charitable part of um, Reuters um, we focus on humanitarian issues, development, and climate change, and we, we've been covering the sort of humanitarian angles of climate change for about 10 years. Um, so I hope that we do it in a more nuanced way than, than some of, of the other media. Now, last year, when all this kind of was coming out in the mainstream media, I distinctly, I, I felt really uncomfortable about, you know, how, what do we do about this? I just, I just didn't feel that we should be reporting these things in a, in, a, in a very kind of big way because, you know, first of all, it quite, some of it was quite well known already. It wasn't actually news, some of it, although perhaps the sort of climate change linkage peer-reviewed aspect of it was. Um, and then secondly, you know, it just kind of felt like going back to the bad old days of climate refugee alarmism. Um, and so we didn't actually do that much. We didn't actually write those stories that, that you're talking about. Um, we had we ran an op-ed by the Centre for Climate and Security about the risks of oversimplifying and underestim underestimating the connection between Syrian, Syrian refugees and climate change. And then my colleague um, picked up on uh, something that was said by a Columbia University professor Mark Levy, I think it was in the um, 
Global Security Initiative conference, and I, I looked at what he'd actually written. So he was he was reporting what Levy had said: um, ongoing violence in Syria is connected with climate change. Levy said it was in the wider context of global insecurity and climate stress. Record drought in Syria from 2006 to 2010 wreaked havoc on agriculture, spurring an exodus of unemployed rural residents into urban areas and intensifying dissatisfaction with the government. That was what we had in our story. Now, I think you could say that that wasn't misrepresenting, but equally, I don't feel like looking back on what we had that we necessarily went into it in enough detail or looked at the real kind of... I think a lot of the media are happy to stick with fairly kind of simple connections, um, not, not sort of going into the real reasons why it stoked conflict, but just kind of making that connection and just kind of leaving it there. And I, I you know, the, one of my takeaways from this is that that's not enough. It's not OK we need to ask more questions to the experts, to the researchers, uh, to the politicians. You know, why, why do you keep making this link? You know, why, what, please explain in more detail what you mean by this, this uh, having caused conflict or whatever. And we have also, you know, reported on how conflict makes countries more vulnerable to climate change and also how the 2014 drought in Syria... Uh, I think there was also drought going on then, made Syrians more vulnerable to conflict and vice versa. You know, so um, I think, you know, that we should have probably done more, but one of the reasons that we didn't do more was because I didn't feel very comfortable to be reporting on, on some of these things without, you know, enough kind of evidence. Um, although I think actually, you know, maybe we should have tried to get more of that evidence. Um, but the problem is, from a journalistic perspective, that there aren't that many journalists working on the ground in Syria um, who have the time and the ability and the security and the, uh, you know, the wherewithal to be able to explore some of these more difficult, complex issues. Because, you know, I know for a fact, you know, our people, uh, Reuters people, that they're, they're reporting on bombs and numbers of people killed and humanitarian issues and uh, hospitals getting bombed and uh, attacked and all these kinds of things. And I think, you know, if you said to them, well, you know, can you just talk to people about what the issues with drought and climate change? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's a question that we should maybe, you know, keep trying to push forward with when, when there's an opportunity. Um, so, I mean, that, that, those are my thoughts really on, on Syria, um, that it's difficult to have a sort of re real-time analysis of, of these issues um, because, you know, if we're working also in conjunction with experts, they're, they're coming back a couple of years later, you know. I'm, I'm happy to talk more about the general coverage of climate change and migration that we do as well. But, yeah, thanks yeah. very much, Megan. And, I, I mean, absolutely, I think Thomson Reuters' coverage... Um, strikes me as some of the best and, you know, most careful and ethical. Um, I think, you know, you were largely dealing, I think, I suspect, with other, other news outlets. Um, I would like to ask both of you quickly, though, um, what you think actually are the risks and what is the potential damage in this kind of misrepresentation? How much does it matter? Alex, do you want to go first? I mean, you talk about this as a <clears throat> negative phenomenon. Right. What's the negative impact? So I think... You know, firstly, the, the dilemma, I think, pro probably for journalists and for people in civil society working on this is you're often caught between two things. On one hand, um, it's very easy to help make a journalist make a headline if you say, yep, this is going to be a catastrophe, it's going to be enormous, it's going to be, you know, whatever. Um, but on the other hand, um, it's very easy to be labelled a climate change sceptic. So I get a lot of emails whenever I, <laughs> whenever I write something that is sort of slightly critical of what I deem or what I think might be anyone kind of like overblowing the connection. Um, I get a flurry of emails from deniers all over the place going, yeah, go you, you know, <laughs> show those, you know, kind of whatever. Um, 
And I think that's just, that is a, that is a difficult place to be. Because on the one hand, you don't want to, you know, kind of go with the kind of catastrophic kind of over, overdoing of the issue. But on the other hand, I don't want climate change sceptics thinking that I'm part of their club. Um, on the risks, I think, you know, the risk really is that <coughs> the, the, you know, the kind of problematic narrative that I outlined, the r- main risk is that just that it simply becomes um, a, a quote-unquote acceptable anti-migrant and refugee story for the liberal media, right? Mm-hmm. They, can't, they can't make r- what we would think of as like a really nasty Daily Mail, Daily mm-hmm. Express um, story, but they can kind of dress it up like, oh, well, we're all worried about climate change, aren't we? Um, and I think that's that's it's that's so, the key problem that it could create. Xenophobia, populism, etc. Yeah. Mm. Megan, how do you see that side of it? Yeah, I think um, I think it can be very damaging um, for the same reasons that you said. Um, but equally, we always have to deal with this situation of having to have a story you know having to have something to report having to have a headline having to have something new to say about it you know so when we have um for example this situation that you were talking about of the the uh, analyses of the of the different uh, you know is there a connection or isn't there a connection between climate change and conflict and then you have researchers having different conclusions and and you know, it just leaves journalists, it, just, it leaves them cold. I mean, you know, is there a connection or isn't there? Your editor is going to be saying, you know, I, I, what, what are you talking about? What, you know, where is the story here that researchers disagree on this? No, that's not a story. You know, so I think uh, I, I'd have to double check, but I, I remember, you know, I've reported on some of the papers coming out, you know, saying that maybe there wasn't a, a evidence, etc. So that also can be a story that, you know, that, that no, actually, you know, we won't have millions of people coming to Europe because of climate change. I think, but we, we've kind of moved beyond that. I kind of feel like, okay, there was this resurgence last year of this narrative around climate change <coughs> refugees because of the European refugee crisis in Paris. But actually, before that, it felt as if things had sort of got a bit better, that we'd, we'd left those sort of bad old days behind in like 2008, whenever it was, and that there's, you know, a much a better understanding. Um, you know, I'm lucky because I work with a climate change, uh, a climate editor who's really, really interested in sort of unpacking the realities of climate change migration. And we've done some really kind of interesting stories from developing countries where, you know, we're looking at, for example, how in India uh, droughts have pushed uh, and problems with farming pushed women into Hyderabad and then they end up becoming sex workers you know because that's the best way that they can make money those kind of stories are really interesting to us or we had one recently on Bangladesh how river erosion is causing people to have to leave their homes and some people are just moving like a few kilometers um, and some people can't even move because they can't get they can't sell their land or their you know those kind of stories we can report intelligently on climate change migration that isn't about waves of refugees coming to Europe. And so I just think we have to, you know, we have to just kind of put that to one side and, you know, just focus on real life examples of when we think climate change migration is actually happening and try and tell those stories of those people um, who, you know, probably, they, they might be some people who are in Calais. That they might be, but you know that equally they might be someone who's just moved a few kilometres away and stayed, or like you say, gone to look for a job and then come home again. Um, and I think you know that's not much. You know that's that's where we should be focusing our energies. Um, and you know we can do that with the help of researchers and NGOs. But I think that there needs to be uh, sort of honesty about what NGOs and experts actually know, what they don't know, you know, so that we can work together to get a better, a more sort of complex picture. I mean, there's obviously the stories also about Alaskan communities voting to to move, relocate. You know, editors love those kind of stories. They love stories, 
about, say, the guy um, from, is it Kiribati, no, who went yeah. to New Zealand and tried to, you know, have a case as a climate change refugee and then, and then didn't get that. You know, but that, that's just one part of the picture. Right. And then there's lots of other parts to the picture. We have to try and give those to. Great. Thanks very much both. Can I just open up any comments on the media link at this point, just general comments at this Hi, point? Hi, I'm Gemma yeah. Green from Chatham House. I just wondered, we talked a bit obviously about the media, but I wondered what, from your perspective, the message for policymakers, uh, particularly in a post-Paris context, um, and for those particularly who should or could be looking at responding better or preparing for the worst impacts of climate change, which may... Thanks. Uh, I mean, there's an interesting point there, which is that there is some follow-up within the Paris process on this, mm -hmm. mostly under the loss and damage article, in fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a process to look at that. I don't know, Claire, you might, if you want to say anything about that, I'll come back to you in a moment. But the second question is here. Yeah. Um, Annie Sims from British Red Cross. Um, I was working in Syria a, a little while ago and heard from colleagues of mine um, about how climate change was impacting on mm -hmm. the humanitarian work and uh, certainly on the response. So you'll hear anecdotally things like, you know, there's increasing desertification. So so it just being east, it's moving across. But being able to get access into those areas to verify things and do studies and take reporters is really difficult. Mm -hmm. So I might hear it from colleagues on the ground, but they're so busy doing the response, I can't really ask them to sort of get that level of detail. But they'll tell you stuff like they're seeing leishmaniasis and sandflies and things that they normally see more in the desert areas moving way across, and they're seeing cha changes in the landscape. And then the things like, um, you know, there are, there are seasonal droughts always, and it? it has been getting worse for ages, but people would normally have a secondary water source, so when your main water source dries up in the, in the summer, you would go to the well, but now the well is, is dry or that river that you used to go and get stuff from, well, that's, that's now drying up. Or because of the conflict, those secondary water sources are compromised. So there's a whole load of other issues there. Trying to make it into a, a good enough package for media is difficult. Trying to get enough sources for media, trying to take them anywhere is very hard. Uh, but it does worry me about the, the humanitarian response because the kind of things that you would do to respond to climate change are now much more difficult to do. Those sort of innovative things that people want to do. It's not like there's a shortage of people with a, with a willingness to, to do it. it. Just You can't get there and do it, let alone what's going on with all the refugees who have gone to Jordan and, you know, how water scarce they are and the pressure that's putting on them. So it puts a big pressure on the humanitarian sector. But I have to say, when you talk to media, normally they want you to produce materials that you can't because you're in the middle of doing everything else. And a lot of the experts and so on that are there have moved on. Thanks very much. Um, Claire, sorry, I missed... Yeah. Uh, John Casterson from yeah, DFID. Okay. Uh, just a reflection on uh, some of the issues. Climate change is largely around risk multiplying. Uh, it's sort of the impact of climate change. That's a very difficult message to communicate. Um, so I wonder if you could think about this. And I think that uh, plays into to your argument around some studies find a, a connection, some don't. Um, it, it depends on what are the elements in the... Uh, in, in that, that risk management and where climate change becomes a decisive risk multiplier as opposed to something that is managed because there were appropriate governance mechanisms in place and other things. But uh, I'd, I'd like to hear your views on that. Thanks a lot, John. I'll go back to the two of you on those three questions at this point, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting what Penny said. I think given the difficulties for journalists in actually, you know, reporting on these issues on the ground from Syria, I think it is really helpful if Red Cross, um, NGOs, researchers can sort of, who might have better access or have better sources even, can share, you know, what they know what they're hearing, what they're seeing, you know, because I think you'll find an open door, actually, if you 
if you come to journalists and say, look, I've just been in Syria, and I, I don't mean you specifically, Penny, but, but yes, you as well, uh, you know, and, and say, oh, no, I heard this stuff, and I think this is really interesting, and I want to write something for you. For example, like on our website, we can publish things by other people, um, and uh, whether they're NGO workers or researchers. And I think, you know, given that there's a real lack of information I think the more we have, the better from trusted sources. And let's, you know, it's good to collaborate and share. And, you know, if there's an opportunity for, for, to take media or to do work with media, then I think, you know, especially when it comes to places like Syria, because we, if I want to go and report on a climate change project in, well, I was just in Senegal uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, because the DFID has a, a big program um, uh, on climate resilience, and that's one of the places. It's easy. I can I can easily go there to to Senegal and to look at these projects. And but I, if I want to go, you know, somewhere where there's conflict, then it becomes much much harder. And quite often, the climate change programs are the first ones that actually. As suspended, or you know, even though there's a lot of talk about doing climate change adaptation and stuff in fragile contexts, I think quite often we hear, you know, partly through our work with this DFID program and other places, that when actually it gets violence kicks off, or you know, then the, then the programs get suspended. So I think you know, it is it, there's some logistics there that we're good to have more cooperation on, and on, on policy makers. I, I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed. You know, on the one hand, they're like saying that we have to have a climate change agreement because of climate change refugees. And on the other hand, we've got a, what is it, a um, task force on, uh, you know, forced displacement under the Warsaw um, International Mechanism on Loss and Damage, which to me, the, the main objective of the US and some of the richer countries is to kind of keep that as much to the side as possible and uh, have as little uh, sort of prominence for that as they can because they're, because they're worried about having to pay up for to compensation for causing climate change. So I just don't know whether that's much of a goer or not, quite frankly. And if that's all we've got, then, you know, there's no appetite for having a new regime for climate change refugees whatsoever. So it'll be interesting to see how the global compact that they're going to come up with by 2018, Mm. how are they going to deal with with climate change as an issue in that? It's not very clear at all. No, I agree. um, Do you want to pick up John's point? Yeah, I mean, I think broadly on, on, on the question of policy, if you look at how to prevent people moving because of climate change you're asking the wrong question like that is going to be a disaster like basically when you try to stop people moving you have something that looks like a crisis or is a crisis um so the reason that people drown in the mediterranean the people the reason the reason people make that journey in boats the reason they walk across you know balkans right is is not because necessarily they can't afford to do, you know, kind of, they can't afford to, to go on a boat or a plane or whatever. They've usually paid way more, like three or four times the cost of an air ticket, right? The reason that they're doing that is because it is not legal for them to simply go to an airport and buy an air ticket and fly to the place where they want to seek asylum, claim refugee status, okay? So it isn't, it, you know, it's our borders that have created that crisis, not necessarily the fact that they are moving, right? With, without that kind of restriction, there wouldn't be a crisis of that scale in the Med. There simply wouldn't be. Like, you, get, you get those um, tragedies when you try to prevent people moving. So I think the way that we have to look at whatever the response is... Um, to climate-linked migration is, you know, really to ask this overarching simple question, which is, are we making it easier or harder for people to move? And if we're making it easier, then I would say that it's heading in the right direction. And if we're making it harder, then it's heading in the wrong direction. And I think, you know, this, um, this is why I've always been slightly... I'm not quite known what to think about the risk multiplier narrative. Because... <clears throat> like, yes, it sounds like kind of very 
neutral, benign language, you can say, well, of course, um, you know, climate change makes, it, you know, various aspects of development or health or whatever harder. So, yeah, OK, why not call it a risk multiplier? But on the other hand, this is language that very much came out of the security think tanks, of the military think tanks. It's an idea, it's a way of framing the issue that essentially came, I think, out of the US military um, response and way of thinking about this. And when you look um, at their solutions, you know, not look, look beyond like just the language, you look at what they're proposing, usually it's how do we militarize this border? How do we subdue this, you know, potential piece of conflict? Um, <coughs> It, you know, in in essence, they are the archetypal. How do we stop people moving with fences and guns and drones and, and whatever? Um, which I would say is only going to lead to more crisis-like, migra- you know, migration refugee situations. Um, so that I hope kind of covers very broadly the the policy area and perhaps some of my some of my cynicism about the. Um, uh, that whole discourse around around security within this debate. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> just a, another way of framing it is to say, I guess, that any form of environmental stress or climate impact does not necessarily produce conflict, so that you, by ne- necessity, have a double failure, failure mm. of human arrangements in two areas. Mm. I mean, I think that's, on, mm. on the moral or ethical side, a kind of helpful guide. It's not so much an empirical point. Um, just uh, quickly, I just Claire, do you have any comments on the Warsaw mechanism? Sorry, I'll, I'll go. Sorry for missing you, but it's just that process that Megan was referring to in rather unflattering terms. <laughs> the follow-up through uh, from yeah. Paris. Do you I have mean, any I, thoughts I, on that? Yeah, I guess um, the, the, there are limits to adaptation. There is going to be a limit to how much um, certain communities can adapt to certain types of conditions. Um, certain types of conditions are going to be able to cope with the future climate, particularly given how, how soon we're going to see this 1.5, they're now saying it's a decade. We're right there now. We're, we're right in the immediate term of action. Um, and so the loss and damage debate is really important for the least developed countries, for the poorest countries, because it's setting out there is a limit to adaptation. It's incredibly uncomfortable for the first industrialised nations of the world. And therefore, I think we, we as sort of, you know, the people involved in thinking about what's the, what's the implications of policy really need to start thinking... What, what actually intangible um, issues actually could make a difference? Because this sort of large debate over, you know, does loss and damage have a place? Well, we now have a mechanism mm. to discuss it. That's a move forward. But it needs to very quickly move into actual possible changes that we can, we can make concrete and that would make a difference. And I think this point that you were just making about... Um, uh, the risk. I mean, when the water wars, we've been talking about water wars for decades, and climate and migration and conflict is really quite recent. But what we learned from that was yes, it quickly securitizes the discourse. Um, that a lot of myths then emerge that are really t- just lead you into um, imperfect action, take you down the wrong road very fast. Um, the, the sort of work that's gone on in South Asia around the Indus and the Ganges. We're working with journalists, in fact, taking them to locations, talking to them about what the evidence really is, to try and debunk the myths, are all required to get public buy-in to the sensible policy action. So let's try not to start with the myths and then have the problem of not being able to take the right action. So I think if we're going to have sensible policy, we need to really think quite quickly about what sorts of actions would make a difference in loss and damage and in migration and think about that in very real terms. What's it mean for small island states? What's it mean for the coast of Bangladesh? And try and unpack that so that we've got sensible actions that, that the US and the UK can buy into. Because at the moment, there's sort of, you know, is this a way of getting a large amount of money for nothing particularly clear is, is the problem. Great. Sorry, I missed you earlier. Yes, yeah. Louise Goodfield. Um, I'm making a documentary about the refugee crisis uh, called Dog Years. And um, I just wanted to say, uh, again, about sort of these um, sensible reasons and how um, perhaps in the future, like, climate change is happening anyway. And I kind of feel like at the moment it's a bit of a scapegoat um, by some of these policymakers and by some uh, of the governments with particular agendas and, and different financing in different places. Actually, the sort of conflict comes from the resistance of that change and of that fact and also from a lot of fear. 
and I agree with you on what you're saying in terms of the misrepresentation um, in the media can add to that, but also how can we um, change um, everyday people <laughs> and their expectations of the media and of not necessarily looking to the popular media for, for facts, but obviously you are going to want to sell, sell stories that people are going to, going to listen to, and um, where can we look to for those platforms in order to, um, to find, uh, find truth and also to find something to move forward into as well, rather than just resisting change. Great, great. Last, oh no, two more points quickly. I'm aware that I'm running down on time quickly. Yeah, I think this is very interesting because one of the real core questions I'm concerned with is whether there's any evidence that reporting you know, large numbers of refugees in the future, you know, my God, they're all coming, millions of them, or whatever. <clears throat> Is that stimulating public concern and possibly demand for action, or is it inhibiting? Um, because, I mean, one of the problems, one of the things that I think is clear is that if we don't manage migration, climate-induced migration globally, wisely, then we will have a tremendous problem, and it will become securitized. So my question is, what do we know? Is there any hard evidence for what kind of reporting, you know, the high end of the risk, the alarmism, or is it more the sort of stories about Bangladesh and the neighbors and the Ganges or whatever? Which kind of reporting is most effective in, in getting the right response? Do we know anything about that? That's a good question. I'm going to take a last one and then come back. Yep. Maybe I can just develop that, just add on to yeah. that. Uh, can you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, that's sorry, I'm friends of the earth. Um, right. uh, maybe just add on to that and, and put it into context. I mean, we're all watching the pictures of Aleppo at the moment and children, mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't changed sensible government policy, it hasn't lifted the, the walls and the fences. So the, so the reality of actually what it means in the north to talk about survival migration, whether it's economic migration, climate, war and conflict, is largely about a lack of empathy and solidarity and justice. So I think how at least some sections of civil society, particularly social movements in the global south, are talking about this is to say, actually, we want to raise it, and it's right that we raise it. I totally agree. It's not about saying they're all coming. It's the reality of the current so-called climate, so migrant refugee crisis, is that the majority of people are displaced internally or in other poorer countries. The West takes, what, 13 14%. So... And we know that at the same time, we've got this urgency. We've got a decade for 1.5, and we know what the impacts are going to be. So the dilemma, I suppose, a little bit is, if you work on the question of power, we don't have enough power to win on climate, the kind of urgent action we need. We don't have enough power to win, at least in terms of having much more sensible uh, policies around migration and refugees. So I think for some movements, the conflict, bringing these two together is also a question about building our power and trying to identify who are the key drivers and who are responsible. So I think it's a slightly different narrative that's coming from some sections, and not that still follows some of the pathway, but not necessarily on in, in the issues in terms of saying it's about scaremongering. So people want to talk about climate refugees. I think it makes more sense and easier to talk about that term, um, because every other term you need to unpack it and explain it, and no, nobody in the media is going to do that. So I suppose some people tend to you know, go towards that, not because it's simple. It's simple and it, it connects everything. People have a huge debate to use migration and all the, the, all the problems with the frame of migration, particularly in the West. So I think, I think it's a very challenging situation in terms of how we, you know, we know in the Paris Agreement we're heading to 3.5. We've heard to, again today another science report saying we're at 400 parts per million, less than a decade, etc. So there's no... I, I, for me, the, the, the debate now is not necessarily about how the media talk about it. I think there's a danger about the security frame, because that will be a response, but it's also about how we create a different progressive narrative around climate-induced migration, which actually is about supporting internally displaced people, temporary migration, all of those who have no legal protection. Now, that UN compact was noticeable that it didn't talk about climate at all, really, within it as a driver. And so for us, I think for many people, we know exactly why loss and damage has been pushed to the side. So if we want loss and damage to have more priority and urgency 
I think this is one of those frames that could help us build the power of people to be able to do that. So I'm just wondering whether you reflect more out of this frame in terms of policymakers and media and how it actually speaks to building power of people. Thanks very much. I'm going to take one last question because it's from Cecilia. Cecilia, Cecilia Tecola. Tecola, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just have one question because it seems to me that one of the real difficulties about all these discussions about migration is that it's so difficult to uh, unpack the diversity of migration. And a lot of the migrants who actually manage to cross borders are the better off and the worse off are the ones who stay. Uh, what seems to be missing to me in what we're talking about is that it seems that it's very much an open perspective. Uh, is there a possibility of uh, making voices of uh, uh, southern media more heard in the north, for example, and which are the ways to support that and to create the, the production of knowledge which comes from the south, which can then more easily reflect diversity, which could also identify, I think, a really important level of government, which is local governments in the south, uh, municipalities. Local governments in the south are the ones who are really worried about people moving to the cities. Uh, and this potentially creates conflict, or potentially creates more misery, as in the case of Bangalore, for example, uh, which we documented recently. So how to link more of a southern perspective and put that, then change things in the way we understand and then we can formulate solutions or improvements? Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of good material coming through, particularly in terms of thinking about what to do and um, how to improve um, the situation at this point. Um, so, but I'm aware there's also a question hanging from the first half of the discussion about um, climate refugees and the extent to which that's a useful frame. So there's quite a lot there. Alex, do you want to take the climate refugees question first and then we'll... Yeah. Some final um, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a phrase, I think you need to distinguish between it as a phrase and as a legal definition and as an overarching narrative and way of conceptualising the whole thing. Um, as, as a phrase for um, looking at it as a legal issue, it's very, it's very difficult. And the risk with it is that it could create for people who are highly exposed to various kinds of disasters, that they might be entitled to a form of legal protection, which they are, in fact, not. So um, I think, of course, you know, you can go into a huge debate about what legal protection is available, but at the end of the day, the phrase climate refugee, I think, probably conveys to someone that they might be able to move um, and then be entitled to similar kinds of rights that convention refugees have. So there's a question there of if we promote this phrase, if we, if we use it, what impression might we be giving about what people who want to move might be uh, entitled to in terms of legal protection? Um, on, on, the other, on the other hand, it does very quickly convey um, that there's a link between climate change and the movement of people. It kind of does it in a snap, in an instant, like there it is. You don't have to go, you know, kind of create this long explanation about how one thing's linked to another. It's just like, you say it and straight away in someone's mind is this idea um, that, the, that the two are connected. Um, so in terms of its, its power to very quickly explain something or, or kind of let someone know that there is, is you know, that that exists, it, it, it's, it's very powerful. But on the other hand, I, I should say, like, basically, like, we operate as a think tank, so we haven't come up with an answer for this. We just kind of, <laughs> on the one hand, this, on the other hand, that. Um, on the other hand, it's a phrase that is rejected by a lot of people who are facing um, the, you know, the prospect of movement. So in the Pacific, um, certainly um, a lot of the um, kind of self-organized relocation programs and even the state organized relocation programs and the movements that have sprung up around how those happen... Um, have really kicked back against being called climate refugees or having the label applied to them for the simple reason that they don't want to move as refugees. 
like the appeal of moving like a refugee is is zero like it says it says what about your future that you'll live in a camp that you'll live you know for the next decade and a half um you know on in kind of as part of an of an aid program um that eventually you might be forcibly repatriated when your country's deemed safe right so like the idea of being a refugee holds very little appeal um, rather, they promote this idea. I mean, Alan probably can, you kind of knows this better better than I do. But this idea of um, migration with dignity, which for for many Pacific communities holds holds kind of much more sway, um, which is that people move safely and legally, become part of a new community, become part of of, of a kind of of a new country, even. So yeah, it has kind of, I think, kind of powerful instant appeal but I think it's problematic because the people who we might want to apply it to have themselves rejected it um, yeah a tricky a tricky one indeed as with many parts of this can I um, I'm aware we're running out of time so um, can I just ask both of you to think in terms of what you've learned from this discussion that you think could be positively applied um, in terms of um, working with media narratives in a more constructive and productive way, if you like. Megan, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, thanks. I think that question about what kind of reporting is going to be the most effective um, in terms of bringing about um, a useful policy response, I think the whole sort of alarmist climate refugee, climate change refugee sort of style of reporting is done its job, had its day, it's pushed the issue into the spotlight and I don't think we need to keep going there with that kind of, I think it's, I think it's counterproductive now, I think if we want you know, the, um, the loss and damage um, mechanism to do a reasonable job and actually address the issue, we need to, the, the media needs to you know, inform the policy discussion with nuanced reporting about different kinds of migration and, and, and how climate change fits into that. So I definitely think, um, you know, it's more useful and better to, to, to focus on um, real people's situations and, you know, what, how are people experiencing this in their, in their actual lives? Because most people don't identify as climate migrants when you speak to them. I was talking to guy in um, a suburb of Dakar the other day, they have big problems with flooding and they're trying to deal with that and he, I asked him a question about oh you know how was this a few years ago he said oh I've only, I only came here a couple of years ago, uh, I was like oh how, why did you move and then just in passing he said oh well we had three years of drought and then a flood came along and washed everyone's stuff away and we, we came here and I, I didn't even, I hadn't even asked him anything about you know any climate impacts um, it's just it just came out in the conversation, and I you know, and I just thought, well, you know, we have to try and you know, when I'm writing stories, I'll try and weave in those elements. And we have, for example, my colleague's been working on a film called Hidden Connections, which is about Bangladesh, and um, this following a story of two girls whose family had to move from a rural area to. Uh, you know, to, to an urban setting and then how there's pressure on them to get married early because, uh, because of the, the hardships. And I, I think, you know, the more that we can do... Um, and we work with journalists from developing countries, so there's, we're a very small team and we commission journalists from developing countries to write about the things that are happening in their own countries because to us that makes a whole lot more sense and you get a better story... And, you know, every time any of those journalists comes to us with some kind of story that's got a migration link in it, we, we you know, we, 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 we want that story. We're really interested in that story. We want to know more, I think. I hope there's more of an appetite. I can't speak for the Daily Mail, really, all those kind of... But from, from what... Um, even, even they, you know, I mean, I just think if you could put a human face on it, and tell people stories of really how this, instead of just talking about them as climate migrants or climate refugees, then you know you're onto a, you're onto a, something that's going to hook people in and help them understand, uh, and and then you know help them put pressure on policymakers or get policymakers to see that it's not just a one-dimensional 
problem. But that's in an ideal world. <laughs> Thanks very much, Megan. Alex, any last thoughts? Anything you could take from this about how to work better around these issues, around uh, media narratives? I think so. picking up on Megan's final point and Cecilia's point about the role of the media in the global south is yeah. really key. Um, because I think what you know what our analysis didn't include was really any any of any of that mm -hmm. and you know that was deliberate because we wanted to be critical of, of the northern media but i wonder whether that you know looking at that might actually create something more hopeful more interesting um rather than just you know us kind of mm. looking at our kind of western media and despairing um and i think um you know the work that Reuters Foundation does, you know, commissioning those journalists to write about write about it is really important. And I wonder whether, um, I mean, I, do, I don't know how this would happen, but I wonder whether, you know, the next thing, perhaps the next most important thing is looking at, like, how those stories that are coming out of those countries by those journalists kind of get more reach, have more impact. Thanks very much, everyone. Um... I guess my final question would be just whether going forward um, there would be any merit in continuing conversation of this kind. Alex, you're probably doing work in this area, but if anyone is interested, feel free to get in touch either with me or with Alex to take forward that conversation. Um, and equally, if anyone has yeah. stunning ideas, uh, things they want to write about and you know points to make, you're equally welcome to get in touch with me and... You know, do, would you like a comment piece on this, or um, yeah. have you got a really good idea for a story, etc.? We welcome. Thanks very much to both the speakers. And to